people don't even know that they have a basic human right. So when I saw the pictures on Tinder, it was this guy that you could see have had a certain lifestyle, traveling around, you know, and he had the look I like. She convinced New York's rich and famous she was a German heiress and then used her lies to live the high life. Hello, my beautiful dubs. My name is Mina and welcome. I'm really excited because one, I got my hair cut. So I got like a little bob and I'm really excited about that because last time I got a bob, I didn't really know how to do any 1920s, 1930s hairstyles, but now I do. So I'm really excited to try it out and get a more um, vintage look going for me. But right now, because I'm lazy, I decided to go for like the 90s, the 90s hair clip look. Other exciting news, I have started start an advice column well, I've been thinking about doing an advice column for a while now, and I asked people on Instagram to submit some questions on a Google form, and I got so many questions. I am honestly shocked that so many people trust me to <laughs> give them advice. I mean, I think I give pretty good advice, but you know, like, it's kind of like a blind thing going on because no one knows what I'm going to say yet because I haven't started um, the column before. So I'll leave a link in the description to where it is. It's going to be published on Substack, so you can either choose to subscribe and get an email every time I publish a column, or you could just like stalk me every so often because it is like a website as well. I'm aiming to post like once a month right now because I don't want to like overburden myself by telling everyone, oh, I'll, I'll be doing this once a week and then I don't have time to do it once every week and then people get disappointed. So low expectations is going to be one month every month. Um, and you know, if I, if I find more time, then maybe I'll publish more often, but okay. So let's get back onto the subject at hand here. So the definition of a scammer is a person who commits fraud or participates in a dishonest scheme. One of my favorite scammer stories actually is from the 18th century. The story goes like this. The year is 1772. King Louis XV was in power and he was infamously sleeping with his mistress, Madame du Barry. He wanted to buy a necklace for her that was worthy of her beauty. And so the royal jewelers crafted a very expensive piece made of 647 diamonds that cost 2 million livres, 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 the currency at the, the French currency at the time. But before he could purchase it, he died of smallpox. <gasps> the jewelry makers, Charles Bomer and Paul Bessenge, then spent 10 years trying to sell it off, begging Marie Antoinette, the new queen of France, to take it off their hands, but to no avail. Here enters our scammer, a young woman, Jeanne de Saint-Rémy, who grew up penniless, but had long deluded herself with dreams of grandeur. Same girl. Jeanne learned that her old benefactress was staying with the very noble Cardinal Prince Louis de Rohan. And unfortunately for him, Marie Antoinette could not stand him. And to be out of the queen's favor at this time was like a social death sentence. He believed that her dislike towards him was the only obstacle in his way to becoming prime minister. So he was desperate to get on her good side. Meanwhile, Jeanne was pretending that she and Marie Antoinette were like BFFLs. She was spreading all these lies across the court to gain good favor among them. Rohan, incidentally, overheard this rumor. Hey. Hey. How you doing? And begged Gian to sway Marie Antoinette into uh, liking him again. So what happened here is that Jeanne told Rohan to send letters to the queen, you know, sweet talking her, whatever. So Rohan did that. He gave Jeanne the letters. And then instead of giving the letters to Marie Antoinette, Jeanne answered his letters posing as Marie. And in her correspondences with Rohan, she often asked him for money, which he gave all willingly. And she used that money to throw these lavish parties and buy the most expensive gowns to, uh, 
once again uplift her social status. I don't want to get into much of the story because it is a story, but I do recommend looking it up because it's actually pretty hilarious. There's so many moments that are just downright goofy. Um, eventually, the royal jewelers heard of Jian's prowess and asked her to convince the queen to buy their necklace that they haven't been able to get rid of. Jian then agreed and then wrote to Rohan asking uh, to borrow money to buy the necklace. But but uh, Rohan himself was in debt, so he negotiated with the jewelers to come up with this like installment plan. Jian, who was tasked as being the messenger and was meant to deliver the necklace to the queen, instead took the necklace home and she and her husband <laughs> hacked it up and resold the diamonds. Since then, we've seen tons and tons of movies and TV shows about scammers, including The Sting in Paper Moon in 1973, A Fish Called Wanda in 1988, Catch Me If You Can in 2002, and The Wolf of Wall Street in 2013. But it seems like it's only been in the last couple of years that we've had like back-to-back -back podcasts, TV shows, movies, you name it. I think the rise in interest for scam-related media coincides with the overall interest in true crime. I'm not like a huge fan of true crime myself just because I find it kind of depressing and stressful and I'm really bad with like violence and gore and I'm overall very paranoid too so I know that it would cause me a lot of anxiety being home alone or just like walking around New York. But I did used to watch BuzzFeed Unsolved back in like 2016. Hey there, demons. It's me, your boy. And I did watch Only Murders Left in the Building very recently. It's definitely a wacky show. Um, I wouldn't say it's that scary. It's about these three tenants who live in this Upper East Side Manhattan apartment building, and one night, someone in their building is found dead. The death is initially considered to be a suicide, but these three are true crime podcast enthusiasts, so they decide to take the case unofficially into their own hands, thinking there must be something more sinister afoot. Oh my God, she's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's not Evelyn. Oh, I could have sworn. That's Barbara. She was a bitch. It's a really fun show, um, even if the acting is a little questionable. I think the mesh between crime and humor is a very unique take on the genre. A lot of people who watch true crime watch it very leisurely. There's this SNL skit about how people will watch a true crime doc while doing laundry or texting their nieces or filing their taxes. I often feel because of how oversaturated the true crime market is, a lot of people have become uh, really used to hearing about really fucked up things. Like they just grow a higher tolerance or lower sensitivity to instances of violence and gore. And that's the same situation with these three characters. The way that they talk about some of the victims is honestly like comedically insensitive. <laughs> Tim Kono's death has now been ruled a homicide, and apparently one of you jerk-offs did it. To prove a point that when you're so involved with true crime media, it gets harder to separate like a story from a real life thing that happened. But anyways, I'm going on a tangent. <laughs> I would argue that scam media is a subgenre of true crime because scamming is a crime. What? And therefore, I think that there's a lot of overlap between reasons why people like scam-related media and why people like, like the, you know, true crime. Maris Harrison, an associate professor of psychology says, I believe we are pre-programmed to tune into things that can harm us, scams, cheaters, and especially murder. I really believe that's why investigation discovery is so popular and also shows like American Greed and even fictional crime like that on CSI. Social psychological research shows that we have a negativity bias. If I told you my boyfriend had a great job, a wonderful family, a rash, and a fantastic sense of humor, my guess is you're probably going to focus on that rash. <gasps> Yeah, side note, this is why I try not to read too many YouTube comments because even though I really like engaging with everyone on this platform, at a certain point when the algorithm starts like pulling in people who are not subscribed to me, uh, I start to get kind of like more negative comments and I know my brain is just gonna be like focusing on that one comment that says, you're ugly and I hate your opinions and not on the hundreds of like really positive comments I get. Thank you, negativity bias. 
So another reason why people like true crime is because of a subconscious desire to know how to protect yourself if you're ever in a bad position. Social psychologist Amanda Vickery, she says, in other words, it's possible people are drawn to true crime stories, podcasts, TV shows, etc. because they are learning ways to prevent or survive a crime happening to them. The same phenomenon could be going on with the new interest in scams. If people learn how they work or who is more likely to be scamming them, they are going to be able to avoid being a victim themselves. None of this is new, by the way. Historian Joy Wiltenberg wrote an article back in 2014 documenting society's interest in true crime. She writes of how starting in the 16th century, sensationalized accounts of crime in the media um, were linked strongly with supporting religious authority, strengthening public order, and highlighting cultural tensions over relationship and family dynamics. Joy gives an example of a 17th century Catholic pamphlet she read, which detailed this horrific crime of a man uh, murdering his entire family. But she notes that the way the story was covered emphasize like what would happen to you if you committed a sin like this. In these cases, especially in countries where religion played a prominent role in the media, which let's be honest, for most of history, religion played a huge role in propaganda in the media. <laughs> But in these cases, true crime was used to stress the power of God and the consequences of sin made evident uh, by the fact that the coverage of the crime was often just as important as the coverage of the punishment. When I read this, I immediately thought about Brothers Grimm and all those really gruesome fairy tales that are meant to just scare children from doing bad things. True crime is kind of like fairy tales for adults, except the things that happen are actually true. Psychiatrist Dr. Sharon Packer adds that schadenfreude is another reason for common interest in true crime. Schadenfreude is a German term that means pleasure derived by someone from another person's misfortune. She says, it's not necessarily sadistic, but if bad faith had to fall on someone, at least it fell on someone else. Whatever the luck of the draw is, at least someone else got the short straw. So there's a sense of relief in finding out that it happened to someone else rather than you. I also think in cases where criminals get caught, there is a sense of schadenfreude because it's like, oh my God, this person is now going to get punished for the crimes that they committed. I think for a lot of people, especially neoliberals, there's this sense that scammers are like really bad people because they are cheating the capitalist system. They didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And so um, the punishment that gets doled out to them at the end is the capitalist economy putting things back into order. At the same time, for others who are blatantly against capitalism. I think scamming is often considered to be aspirational and the fact that there usually is no assaults or violence involved makes it easier to sympathize with the scammer without feeling any guilt. Psychologist Maria Konnikova told the Huffington Post, you can really ignore the victim and just focus on how clever and charismatic and charming and audacious the con artist is. Scammers can also fall under the good old entertaining get rich quick fantasy narrative genre that includes stories like winning the lottery, getting a magical fortune cookie, the Cinderella story, etc. You know, everyone talks about the fake it till you make it strategy, which is actually really hard to do in practice. I feel like scam narratives like allow us to see the behind the scenes process of someone who is able to successfully do it, even if just for a short time. Gia Tolentino writes in her book, Trick Mirror, on today's terms, figures like Malachi Love Robinson and Anna Delvey are highly inspirational. As Women's Conference after Women's Conference might have told me had I attended them, it's precisely that kind of self-delusion, deciding beyond all reason that you should have something and then going for it that will get you somewhere in this world. I haven't finished uh, reading Trick Mirror, but I think Gia Tolentino is a great writer. I've read several of her pieces that were published on The New Yorker, and her mind is just like, Pfft. So for this video, though, I did the cardinal sin of skipping ahead in a book. I can't believe you've done this. Because she does have one chapter that I thought was really applicable to this video, and it's called The Story of a Generation in Seven Scams. What I find really fascinating about this particular essay is that she talks a lot about these systemic scams. Like she talks about student loans, girl bosses, social media, and how all these things are just major scams, which, you know, it really makes you think society is a bit of a scam, isn't it? <laughs> 
She then writes, What a relief within this world of borderline or inadvertent or near invisible scamming to have a category delineated by egregiousness, the obvious unmistakable scams. I think in this crazy, crazy world that we live in, scam narratives are a sense like an entertainment scapegoat or a way for us to like vent out the unfairness and lies that corporations and influencers spread. Like I really think about how face tuning and social media in general just like generally encourage deceit. I can't even tell you how many influencers I either have seen or personally know who just like fake their entire online presences. Um, they fake the kinds of opportunities they get. They fake um, the kind of events they get into. They fake uh, the amount of money that they have or how they get that kind of money. And the cycle just never ends because a lot of these people know that envy brings them followers. Um, when you live a very aspirational life, you get followers who are interested in seeing this life even if it's completely fabricated. Another thing I want to note is that male and female con artists are treated differently because of gender, because we live in a society. <laughs> I was reading the book Confident Women, which is this little book that gives little biographies of different women scammers throughout history. There's also a really good chapter on Gion de Saint Remy in it, if you're interested. The author, Tori Telfer, told Chandelayant in an interview, I think male con artists, at least for most of history, have been put on a higher pedestal. I think the reason for that is that confidence is an art, and a lot of the things we like about it are also things we kind of attribute to men. It takes guts, it takes cleverness, it takes bravery. I've covered the femme fatale uh, trope in another video where I kind of like dive more into that archetype. For much of history, women have been coded as being meek and modest um, in comparison to men. So the archetype of like a seductive, deadly woman who wants to take power away from men has been a frightening concept in our patriarchal society. The easiest example I can think of off the top of my head is that of witches in 17th century Europe and America. A lot of the lore surrounding witches at this time was that they had sex with the devil and conducted their naked rituals, thus making this link between a sexual woman and evilness. So now in the 21st century, a lot of women have reclaimed this like deadly woman label. <laughs> Case in point, the very cringeworthy, uh, memeable line, We are the daughters of the witches you didn't burn. Also, the whole good for her cinematic universe that includes movies like Gone Girl, Ex Machina, Midsummer, revolve around the concept of celebrating morally reprehensible women who bring doom onto their male partners. Or ex-partners. I don't think liking any of these female characters is inherently a bad thing because I think anti-heroes are really cool. Um, and I think they honestly show the messier parts of the human condition, which I really appreciate from a character analysis point of view. Because let's be honest, no one in real life is strictly good or strictly bad. But I do think it can be dangerous in the case of biopics when characters are, you know, actually real people and the tone of the narrative can cause viewers to become obsessed with the bad guy. <clears throat> Ted Bundy. In saying that, I do want to clarify that I am pro-sympathetic portrayals of uh, villain characters because I am pro-restorative justice and I think restorative justice requires a certain level of sympathy for both the victim and the perpetrator. But it is a very fine line and I think a lot of screenwriters don't consider that enough. I've kind of alluded to this phenomenon when I've been talking about people who are pro scammers, but uh, nothing out there at the moment really compares to the girl bossification of Anna Delvey. A brief summary is that Anna Delvey was a con artist posing as a German heiress. She swindled the upper class echelons of Manhattan into funding her exclusive art space project dubbed the Anna Delvey Foundation that never ended up getting created because she was caught. Netflix recently released a biopic on Anna called Inventing Anna, and it was pretty bad. I tried to watch it, but I could only get through about three episodes before I mentally checked out. The camera and dialogue was just like very Lifetime movie, and overall, I didn't find the story compelling, which is very sad because I remember being extremely invested in Anna's case when it was happening in real life. Like, I thought it was the craziest story I had ever heard. <laughs> 
The way that the show is crafted is also meant to make viewers sympathize with Anna. There's a lot of hashtag feminism moments with Anna often criticizing male privilege and how it operates in corporate structures. An interesting thing I found while watching the show is that they put a lot of emphasis on how Anna is a woman and how she is oppressed in this space because she is a woman. But there's no real comment on how she is white and how um, it was only possible for her to continue the charade for as long as she did because she was a white woman. Lauren Trumfio further wrote for Refine Magazine, Inventing Anna clearly sympathizes with Delvey as it often portrays the con woman as a go-getter, a result of New York's intoxicating hustle culture that leaves women astray. Delvey didn't just dream, she achieved. People had their doubts about her, but she did not let their judgments interfere with her goals and ambitions. It's almost like the series portrays her as an every woman hustling for the American dream. Part of why it's easier for people to sympathize with Anna Delvey is... Unlike other con artists like Elizabeth Holmes and Maria Duvall, who scammed sick people, Anna Delvey scammed the upper class. Like, does anyone really care if a multi-millionaire investment banker loses a little bit of money? I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you something. <laughs> we don't care. This logic is also why I think a lot of us aligned with the main characters in the movie Hustlers, which came out in 2019. Hustlers was based on a real story in which a group of sex workers drugged and stole money from a bunch of rich New York businessmen. While I am, for the record, anti-drugging people without their consent, the movie makes it hard for audiences to care about these wealthy victims who objectify women and fucked up the economy. But unfortunately, the way that we perceive Anna's actions as a result um, of inventing Anna, it just feeds into girl boss feminism. Rachel Deloche Williams wrote an article for Time in February called Anna Delvey Sorokin Almost Ruined My Life. Now she's being rewarded for her crimes. Rachel helped set up the sting operation that led to Anna's arrest. This came after Anna left her $60,000 in credit card debt, which was apparently more than she made in a year. Like a girl boss does. Anna's branding of feminism is her toppling over her friends and other women to get ahead. Gia Tolentino criticizes the individualism associated with girl bosses, writing, the problem is that it is so easy today for a woman to seize upon an ideology she believes in and then exploit it, or deploy it in a way that actually runs counter to that ideology. That is in fact exactly what today's ecosystem of success encourages a woman to do. Rachel goes on to criticize how Netflix paid Anna $320,000 thousand dollars for the rights to her story she says if your crimes are splashy enough a media company could snatch up the rights to your story pre-trial so that you're able to afford the attorney of your choice one skills enough to minimize your penalty you could be paid so much money that even after your funds are frozen and victims are repaid you have cash left over and not only that but if fame is what you're after you'll have built yourself a brand created a platform and found an audience to leverage for future opportunities it's strange you know because at the same time that Inventing Anna has been created, I feel like a lot of us are deviating away from girl boss culture. Like, the idea of being a girl boss has become a meme. Gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. <laughs> Michelle Obama herself has criticized the girl boss, white feminist uh, advice book called Lean In during her book tour in 2018. That whole so you can have it all? Nope, not at the same time. That's a lie. And it's not always enough to lean in because that bleep doesn't work all the time. So what I think is particularly ironic um, about the girl bossification of criminals and con artists is because it's about people trying to support or empower the narratives of complex women or women who don't have their shit together. But the result is the same. The girl bossification of the CEO and the girl bossification of the criminal are just two sides of the same coin. Both exploit other people and both only care about themselves and not womanhood as a collective. But, and I'm gonna say something really crazy that might confuse you all, but two things can be true at once. Anna Delvey also appeals to the movement, the counter movement of people who are against uh, female success in capitalism. I'm sure you've all seen the tweets and TikToks of young women claiming that they're in their flea bag era, which is something that Emma Garland describes perfectly in an article for Dazed. We all recognize her, the woman in her flea bag era. We know that she is prone to showing up at work in last night's makeup, smoking two cigarettes for breakfast, or experiencing the feminine urge to fuck her sister's boyfriend. We have spotted her everywhere, from the listless Rachel in Virginia Woolf's Voyage Out, to the checked 
out narrator of Otessa Moshfei's My Year of Rest and Relaxation. We know that she performs her pain as if it were a form of art, something outside herself that can be controlled and yet chooses to revel in it regardless. Side note, I also think the concept of being in an era is indicative of why scammers are so popular to begin with. I myself really love the phrase being in an era because I think it's totally normal for people to want to reinvent themselves throughout their lives. And the idea of like being in an era also indicates that it's a phase and that we are constantly growing, constantly developing, and whatever we reinvent ourselves to is not like a permanent reinvention. I mean, it could be, but it doesn't have to be. So anyway, in a lot of these scammer stories, the main character confidently rebrands themselves once or even multiple times. So I think it definitely triggers some kind of relatability and therefore keeps us more invested when we watch someone who is able to reinvent themselves so successfully. Something that I've also realized, and no hate to the Fleabag era girls, like I know y'all are going through something, but I've noticed that some of them tend to be uh, pretty self-indulgent and consumerist. And they're definitely critical of how women are expected and pressured to be successful and or put together. And in a way, Anna does appeal to this note of dissociative feminism. Even though she's constantly talking about how she's like a woman in business, most of her money just goes to clothes, stays in luxury hotels, um, fancy vacations. She also like doesn't really participate in hustle culture because she's not trying to prove herself via a work ethic way. She's just trying to like make it to the top lying. <laughs> Lauren Trunfia writes, the philosophy of a scammer is, why do the most when you could do the least for the same or even better results? That is precisely why Elizabeth Holmes and Anna Delvey went to such lengths to deceive the people around them. They wanted to be wealthy, comfortable, and respected without doing any of the difficult work that is typically required for a woman to get to that point. I don't know, in the end, I think scammer content is fun. <laughs> I love a good scam. Um, a Fish Called Wanda, one of my favorite movies. Paper Moon, one of my favorite movies. I love a good scam. But I'm kind of tired of biopics in general and how like all these like crime scam stuff is always like rooted in a real story. Like what happened to fiction? I miss, I miss fiction. <laughs> and aside from like my notions against biopics, I also think it's just like a little dangerous for people who were not involved at all in what happened to use a real story, over dramatize it as they please, take as many creative liberties, um, even create some fabrications, all in the hopes of just getting an Emmy. The tagline for Inventing Anna is, this whole story is completely true, except for all the parts that are totally made up. It's a cute tagline, but it also works to absolve the production team from like any consequences for spreading misinformation. <laughs> And of course, the ethics of paying someone off for the rights to their story is uh, questionable. Rachel Deloche Williams alludes to these industry malpractices in her Time essay, but while I turned down press requests, I watched media outlets give Anna a platform without holding her to account with strangely convivial interviews in which she tried to pass off criminal behavior as a form of high art. Talk is cheap and con artists are good at it. I thought, why are we handing one a microphone? But let me know what you think about con artists in the comments. I'm definitely interested in hearing whether people think um, it's just like straight up entertaining or whether they think it's like a negative thing that audiences become obsessed with the story. I'd also love any recommendations for movies or TV shows that have to do with crime because I'm like kind of, I, I might be going into my true crime era. I'm not sure yet. I, I'm a little scared, but... I feel like I've been called to it after watching Only Murders in the Building. I've been influenced. <laughs> but I think like for now, I definitely am staying away from biopics in general. I just like don't really have that much interest in them. Like I, I'd rather just watch a documentary of it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think all biopics are bad. I've heard really good things about The Dropout and I watched only a few episodes of it. I don't know if I'll finish it. I think Amanda Seyfried is like a really talented actress and I think her Emmy is definitely coming, but I don't know. I'm just like not so interested in the story of Elizabeth Holmes, which is like what the entire show is about. So I don't know, but I do think it was good for the two episodes that I watched. <laughs>
Okay, I'm gonna end the video with a quote from Tori Telfer for the New York Times because I think it's quite sweet. The fact that people get swindled actually says something really lovely about humanity. It says that we are all willing to trust each other. Aww. Okay, thank you all for spending time with me. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye.